know either. <laughs> praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It is good to be before you again, solid word. Amen. It is good to be before you again. And um, I thank the Lord for all of you, my family, my friends that came to support. Praise the Lord. I pray that there is a word that you would uh, hear from the Lord today. Um, we're going to read some before you stand. I want to ask you if you could do something real quick. Take just a few seconds. I'd like for you to, uh, I got a question I want you to think about. And if you, uh, if you got a pen on here, just think about it uh, and uh, kind of keep it with you as we move forward. And that question is, I want you to write the feeling that describes what you felt the day you got saved. If you got a pen, just, just a few words that you don't have to share with me. We ain't going to call you a family feud is over. <laughs> I don't know who won and who cheated. Uh, but uh, thanks, Keith. Um, but I would like for you to take a few moments, really, just to really think back to that day. Think back to that day when darkness became light suddenly. Suddenly. And just record the emotion or the feelings that you, that you thought of that day. We're going to get back to that. But that feeling that you thought when God reached out and you saw the son on the cross high and lifted up, knowing that he was resurrected, died on your behalf, <laughs> resurrected, that you would be resurrected with him, that you are now a citizen of heaven. Amen? Yes, so if you would, let's look into our bulletin as we stand. We're going to read our theme verse, and then we'll deal with another text after that. And that, that verse is in the center of your bulletin. It is Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. Please say amen when you have it. Amen. All right. It's in the ESV, and it reads, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch their flock that night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was the angel, a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those whom he is, he is pleased. Amen? Amen? If you would, as you know, I read without rhythm. Uh, turn to Hebrews. We, we, we're going to go to our subject text real quick. Hebrews chapter 10. Um, we'll be dealing with, for our time, Hebrews chapter 10, beginning at verse 32, uh, walking down to verse 36. Hebrews 10, 32 through 36. Please say when you have it and I'll read. I got some page turners. Say, wait a minute if you need a moment. All right. And so we're pretty much about there. And it reads, But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For you, and again, verse 34, for you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we bless your name and just thank you for who you are because you are awesome, you are mighty, you are the source of our joy. 
Father God, you are the gladness that is in our heart. Father, we thank you that it's not circumstantial or situational. Father God, but it's eschatological. Father God, the big words, Father God, we know that we're looking to the end in this joy of what we're going to receive that we've already been granted by the guarantee of the Holy Spirit that's indwelling in us. Father, we thank you and we pray that you use this word to strengthen us, to encourage us, Father God, to walk out that joy that you've given us through Christ. It's in your darling son Jesus' name we do pray. And all the degrees that amen. amen. Please be seated in the house of the Lord. In C.S. Lewis's book, The Screwtape Letters, he is counseling his nephew, Wormwood, about how to win believers away from Christ, away from God, as the enemy, as he calls him. And while trying to encourage Wormwood on how to do that, he speaks of this phenomenon called the law of undulation. The law of undulation. And so that law of undulation, and undulation being the trolls and the peaks of water, of waves, the peaks and valleys of water as it goes up and comes down. And what he's trying to get Wormwood to emphasize is that life is full of ups and downs. But while emphasizing the ups and the downs, he's trying to get Wormwood to extend his focus on the downs, on the valleys, on the hardships. He's pushing him to push to the Christian that life is really not about purpose, passion, or promise. He's pushing a message of despair and discouragement. Wormwood is trying to push them to a life that is essentially a life without Christ. A life without Christ. I don't know if you've been there or not where it seems like your life has been full of more downs and ups. And what he's really suggesting while he's pushing this is that, you know, the waves when you go up, you have a momentary joy to only come down and find out that you've made really no progress at all. You've moved one foot forward, two steps backwards. That's what he's pushing Wormwood to do to believers. He's trying to counsel out the joy in the body of Christ. Saints, if you allow me just for a few moments, I like to preach from that backdrop for subject or theme, getting to the promise, getting to the promise, getting to the promise. I want to revisit that question I just asked you for a moment with a follow-up question, and that question is this. Does that feeling that you just wrote down about your day of salvation, does that still characterize your experience with Christ? Is it the same as it was on the first day? I presume if you were like me, you talked about smiles when you look back and you thought about it, that salvation, you didn't care about anything or anyone else. It was really all about you getting out of the despair that you were in. And that despair, to some degree, was earth-focused until you met Christ, and Christ told you that that despair really had a lot more penalty behind it that you really didn't know about that you could have been busting hell wide open and dwelling in eternity apart from God, paying for your sins from Adam forward to you. It's interesting that when we seen Christ for the first time, nobody, wife, husband, husband, daughter, job, brother, sister, Mary or Martha, didn't matter. Does your experience with Christ right now resemble what you wrote down a few moments ago? Does it resemble that and why? I was given an article about why Christians don't have joy. And when I read the article, I thought it was really a, a current article, but actually it was written three years ago. But the premises and the principles were so current. Because really what he suggested is, is that when believers don't have joy, the emotion of salvation, as he terms it, when they don't have joy, it's because they've got one foot in heaven and one foot on earth. Hmm. It's not Jacob's ladder. He's saying we're trying to live in two worlds. We're trying to live in two worlds. We're citizens of heaven. No, of course we're here. 
But we're here with our mind stayed on heaven, stayed on Jesus. So I ask you, if your feeling that you wrote down in the beginning is not like it is now, if they, if they don't match up, if they don't mix, as my daddy always say, could it be that you're trying to live in two different worlds at the same time? We're in the book of Hebrews, as you've, as you've been in before, I'm sure. This book is about the superiority of Christ, the supremacy of Christ over angels, over Moses, over the law, over the, the, uh, the old covenant, over the priest, temple worship. We talk a lot about who wrote this book. We don't know who wrote the book, but we know, we don't know who he was, but we, we know what he was. We know he was a believer. We can look at the body cam of the scriptures that he wrote and show that the burden of proof has been met, that it's clear and visible for us to see that this man knew Christ. He, 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 he's writing to three different audiences. He's writing to believers, unbelievers, and head knowledge believers who seem to think they know Christ, but through persecution and suffering actually don't know Christ. They're not bearing fruit for Christ. It's a little bit like church in our time where we have those three unidentified groups dwelling amongst us. I've been one of the three at different times, so I ain't throwing no shade at nobody. I'm just saying that it just looks like today. <laughs> and what's happened is that they were demoting Christ uh, in the Qumran Valley. They were getting away from Judaism because of persecution. It's much like our day. They wanted to go back to Judaism, uh, getting away from Christ to go back to Judaism because Judaism was a popular religion. And it's kind of like what we do. We want to go back to popular things, popular traditions, uh, popular thought. We want our truth over the truth. We want Oprah to tell us about it. We want Greenleaf to give us a picture of church, but we don't want church. Mm. Mm. It, 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 was, it was a day like our day. You know, we turning away from the risen Savior and going back to Oprah Winfrey and Deepak Chopra and all these people telling us about what faith really is. We got the master's class without the master. Mm. Uh, and, and we maybe we don't blatantly walk away from it like they did, but 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 that's what what we're seeing here. They they're walking away from the popular from this this uh, startup religion for the popular religion, all for the sake to end the suffering, the trials, and the tribulations that they're going through. And all the while, what the author is trying to convey to them is Jesus is supreme over all things. Here's we arrive in our subject text. What he's trying to suggest to them after he's dealt with verses 26 through 31, he's talked about the, uh, the futility, the false faith of those that don't persevere in the faith. That when they see persecution, they turn and run away from Christ. They've fallen away. Now, it's a hypothetical thing because if you're in Christ, once saved, always saved. Come on, sing the Sunday school song with me. You know it. Once saved, always saved. He, he, he's talking about this group in verses 26 through 36 that are deliberately sinning. They're living a life that looks nothing like Christ, but looks just like they used to look. And he's telling them that, 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 that you, that this is a false faith, as MacArthur would term it. He's suggesting that because of the sufferings, and sometimes our sufferings are really just a litmus test to show where our hearts at. Hmm. It's it, it, Jesus shaking up the things that won't remain to reveal what will remain. Mm. Something, when you got a storm going on, don't get it twisted. It's just a test. Mm. Jesus is just trying to show you where you stand. Mm. He's trying to let you know where your heart dwells. And so in verses 26 through 31, that's what he had just did. He had just shook things up to, 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 to bring out the third group. Mm, the, the, the head knowledge group, you know, the Bible knowers, the toters, you know, those guys, the ones that, that carry these things, the big ones, <laughs> the big ones. Yeah, it was too heavy for me to preach from this one today. I had to put it back. Thank God my daddy was here. Uh, I had a hernia up here. But, 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 you know, the ones that carry these things, you know, they, they, they can tell you everything that Jesus said and what Jesus did, what Jesus thought about doing, but didn't do because you wouldn't have understood it. But then, but then when the storm came, Nowhere to be found. False faith. Situations and circumstances are what God allows Satan to use to reveal the foundations of the heart. Are you firmly footed in Christ? And so he just let, pulled out one group. 
And so as we move into our first point of getting to the promise, let me usher in our first point of emphasis of getting to the promise. That first point is remember your earlier faithfulness in Christ. Remember your earlier faithfulness in Christ. Reading verses 32 through 30, 34, we'll see this point realized. It says, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. Mm. You, you joyfully accepted the plundering, the seizing, the confiscation of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Mm. Looking at that term recall right there is the Greek word anamonesco. It, 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 oh, I tried that all morning to get that right. Thank God I got it right. Uh, I ain't going to do it again. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's a present tense passive now. Now, that, that word right there means to cause one to think again. To think again, to prompt them to remember, to not just reflect, but to think again, to deeply think again. It's the same word that Paul used in 2 Timothy 1 and 6 when he reminded Timothy to get off his tail and get to ministry. Mm. It's a word that is meant to provoke a response. It's take you back so you can remember, you can think deeply, examine to produce what you had then now. He said, think back when you was faithful. Think back to when you first got saved. How did you feel then? What did your life look like then? Mm, how were you enduring then? So he says, remember your former faithfulness in Christ. And what he wants to do is right there, he wants to lift up three things in that section that we'll touch on. First, he wants you to look back to the cross. Mm, look at that word right there, enlightened. That word enlightened right there means it's, it's, it's pointing to the fact that you received the gospel been brought out of death to life. Paul talks about this in Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, when he said, after you heard the word of truth and believed, you received the Holy Spirit. Hmm. He talks about it again later in verse 18. He says that he prayed that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened. Why? So we could learn and enjoy and understand the richness of the glory that is in the inheritance given to the saints. Look back to when Christ first brought the truth to you and you were enlightened, that you were changed from your former thinking. But watch what he says here. Secondly, he says this. So it means that you think back to when you got to always go back to when you at first got to go back to the cross. It always is relevant. Always starts there. Then he says, secondly, he says, he wants you to look back. He said, you had compassion. That second thing is remember when you were focused on others more so than yourself. Mm. Look, look what he said. Now, he said, for you had compassion on those in prison. And, and right before that, he says that you had faced hard struggles and sufferings. You had compassion. You sympathized with those that were in rougher situations than you or if not equally, or maybe not so hot, maybe less. He said, but those hard struggles was irritations with people. It's when the coworkers get on your nerves. It's when they've done something at work that you didn't expect them to do, and they brought challenges in your life. But, but, the, but the, not that hard struggle, but, but also that suffering is adversity in other places. So you had hell at home and hell out in the streets. But yet, you didn't get stopped up with yourself. See, see, you sympathize with those that were facing trouble and triumphs outside of you. He said, remember the cross. Remember your love for others. And then thirdly, he brings it. He said, he wants you to remember this joy. Look what he says right there, this joy. He said, for you had compassion on those in prison and you joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Looking at the grammar, there is something interesting. If you look at just on surface value, compassion and joy feeling look the same. Compassion looks like it's an adjective. Joyfully looks like an adverb. But joyfully is a noun. Person, place, or thing. Oh, my bad. 
Remember when you had that possession of joy. Remember when you possessed that gladness of spirit. Looking back to that word enlightened, it was in the passive, which means that enlightenment wasn't something that they had did. When you came to the truth, when you received grace, it's not what you did. It's what God had did to you. But how did he do it? Joy is fruit of the spirit. So that joy that they possessed was meaning that they had got saved and was now walking in the spirit. He said, remember when you have received the spirit, the fruit of your salvation, the spirit that is carrying you has produced fruit to where you were glad. Mm. If it was an, ad, an adverb, what it would look like is remember when they took your stuff and you got happy about it. <laughs> and you got happy. Remember when you were reactionary. <clears throat> That's not what he's saying. He's saying, you didn't have a joy that left because your stuff, that they got there because they was taking your stuff. You had a joy that lasted even though they took your stuff. Mm. So you had a gladness that wasn't circumstantial or situational. It wasn't like some people. It wasn't fair weather. You had a joy that was abiding. That word abiding means remain. And he said that you endured. You persevered. The word persevere right there is in the Greek is hupomeno. It's a compound Greek word. The word hupo means to be under. The word meno means to remain. But here's something tricky about that. When he started talking about uh, this abiding possession, that word abiding is the word meno. Hmm. So when you endured, you were under and remaining. But this possession that you got in Christ is remaining. It ain't under nothing. It's overcoming. It's overcoming. You have an abiding possession in Christ. So what am I saying? What he told him is this. If you look back to the cross through the revelation of Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit, what will happen is you will do an evaluation and appraisal of what you're going through, and you'll find out that what you possess is bigger and better than anything that can come at you and can be taken from you. You have an abiding joy that's bigger than your wife, bigger than your son, bigger than your daughter, bigger than your husband, bigger than your job, bigger than your health. You have an abiding joy. You have a joy that will walk with you. Because this joy is always eschatological. It's always pointing to the Savior coming back. It's what you've already received, been guaranteed through the Spirit, and what's coming when he comes to deliver. But not only will he come to deliver you, but you will get to walk with him in God's glory. You ain't just going and getting there and saying, Woo, I made it. No, you're going to walk in God's glory. That means you're going to walk with the King of kings, Lord of lords, the creator of heaven and earth. That is the abiding joy. I ain't angry, wife. I know you want me to calm down. <laughs> you have an abiding joy. You have to, if you're going to stand in joy for Christ, if you're going to get to the promise, you have to take an assessment. You have to assess what's going on, but the assessment has to always start with the cross. As I close this point, that word recall, what I didn't point out is in the present tense. This assessment to the cross is not something you do because you have struggles. It's who you are. The present tense, it gives no uh, understanding or in, in, indication of starting and ending. It's just a state of being. He said, be in a constant state of remembering the cross, the joy this abiding, this better, oh, that word better right there, that word better is superior. You have a superior possession. This book is about what? The superiority of Christ over angels, over what Moses did, over the old covenant, through the blood of Christ Jesus. And now Christ has brought it home to our lap and said he's also superior over your circumstances and situations. He's superior over whatever you're going through, whoever's coming at you, whatever's going on inside of you. He's superior. Christ will shake up everything to reign. To reign. And sometimes, because we're in this journey of dying to the flesh to be made like him, when we're transformed in his image, when he comes back. And guess what? If we don't suffer now, we don't triumph with him later. If we don't suffer now, that means we, when he shows up, we look like one of his enemies. 
And so what we're fearing right now to be conquered, we actually will experience a conquering. Amen. We'll be like the people in the first five, them five verses, 26 through 31. So he says, remember your earlier faithfulness. The interesting part of this, and I'll close this point, is that sometimes when storms happen, we get shook up, right? We get shook up. And we start to feel like we're losing things. I was talking to Pastor Taylor this week, and he had shared something with me that I think fits here. And there's a story he told me. He told me a story about a, a, a young man and his father on a boat, possibly out fishing. And while they were out fishing, the storm came, and it, it got dark, and they couldn't see their way back. And they're struggling and trying to figure out how to get back and everything and don't know how they're going to make it. Pretty much probably said their prayers and did a couple of Hail Marys, depending on what parish they came from. Um, and, and, and so they, they weren't going to make it back. And so what happened was they ended up seeing a light. Wouldn't you know, out of the darkness, God showed up. They saw a light, saw the lighthouse. And so they saw the lighthouse and, man, made it back, man. As soon as they got back, just like my wife, ran out there and said, Oh, I'm glad y'all back. Y'all made it in the storm. She was super happy. Man, lo and behold, she told the husband and the son, she said, I'm glad y'all back, but our, our house caught on fire. We lost everything. Can you imagine that? You out there in the storm, get back. They tell you your house don't caught on fire. You lost everything. Messed up. But then the husband said, girl, don't trip. <laughs> Urban version. Girl, don't trip. <laughs> he said, uh, he said, uh, if it wasn't for that fire, we wouldn't have made it back. Because that fire was the light. It wasn't the lamp. It wasn't the lighthouse at all. Wow. It was a house. So the things that you think is burning up, yes. mm, it's really only revealing what really matters most. Yes. It's only revealing what matters most. <laughs> Don't trip off the storms. Just remember when you were formerly faithful in the Lord. That's right. And, and that, that, that's what God is trying to tell you. But then after he tells them that, it don't end there, but he, he goes and he says, look here, as we, we got to remember that this abiding nature, this is lasting salvation, uh, be consistent in a consistent state of remembering. But if we're going to get to what God has promised, we have to remember how we have responded faithfully. And then we also, there's another step of what he tells them to do to get to the promise. As I usher in my second point of emphasis, our second and final point of emphasis is, don't abandon your confidence. Don't abandon your confidence. Don't abandon your boldness. Don't get, don't get away from your assurance. Looking at verse 34, I believe it's 35, rather. 30. It says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance. Mm. So that when you have done the will of God, not your will, when you've done the will of God, you may receive what has been promised, not what you wanted, what has been promised. Not what you hoped for, uh, what he said he was going to give you already. Uh, you may receive what is promised. Looking at that word, see, abandonment happens when we trash what God has given us. That word, therefore, as you've heard it many times, any preacher worth his salt to say, that word, therefore, is to let us know, what, make us ask what it's there for. So let's find out what it's there for. But it's also to tell us that it's connecting what's about to be said to what was just said. So he says, therefore, don't, it's a conclusionary term too. He says, do not throw away your confidence. The word throw away is a compound Greek word, apobalo. The word apo, apo means to, uh, the separation of a thing. It means it's cast off, the separation of a thing. And the word um, apobalo, it means that what it suggests that it's an undesired severing of a relationship. Hmm. Much like when there's an adoption and the child is separated, and the blood bond is rendered useless because there's no fellowship. He said, don't throw away your confidence. Don't make this fellowship useless. It's, he said, don't, don't cast it off. It's that Greek word, that word confidence is uh, parisia. It's, and I'm, I don't be too Greek on you, but, but that, that, that word is parisia. It's a Greek political term that has history with it. See, it, uh, it's the privilege of a citizen. It's the idea that they could, had the freedom to express their opinions because they were a Greek citizen. 
It's that boldness. They had the open right to share their thoughts about what was going on in Greece. But it also makes them distinctive from a slave or a visitor because they don't have the right. He said, don't throw away your openness, your boldness. That Don't throw away your citizenship in heaven. Mm. It's a twofold reality. It's an out, in the New Testament, it's a public declaration, but it's an outward demonstration of an inner assurance. Mm. Outward demonstration of an inner assurance. It's openness to God that we have un, unimpeded access to Christ, and we have, therefore, as a result, openness before men. We have a boldness before men. We don't shrink back. Hmm. See, he said that that word throw, throw away, it it carries the idea of casting something up in the air and not caring where it falls. See, it's saying that I'm so focused on everything around me that I've tossed everything up and it don't matter where it lands. See, he's saying don't don't, don't throw away your boldness in Christ because you're so focused on what's going on around you. You don't care where that confidence goes. You don't care what happens. You don't care what Christ is talking about. As long as your mortgage is paid, as long as your honey dip is right, as long as the children act right, as long as the money is right, as long as the health is right, you don't care what Christ is talking about. You don't care about this salvation. That's over and done with. We're not living for him anymore. You just toss it up in the air and don't care where it lands. It didn't toss you up. Christ doesn't toss us up. We toss him up. He doesn't walk away from us. What can separate us? What can separate us? We separate ourselves. We don't break the relationship as far as the blood bond, but we do break the fellowship. Because we stay saved. Remember singing the song, Sunday school, once saved, always saved. That's that's what he's illustrating. Don't, Don't do that with this confidence. He says, don't do that. But how do you know that they didn't have confidence? And I'm going to wrap this up quickly. (laughs) We can see this earlier in the text from verses 22 through 24, 25, 22 to 25. He hits them with three letters imperatives. It's what he tells them to do that indicates what they were not doing. And I'm going to read through them and just summarize them to get us out of here. Uh, In verse 23, he says this. He asked, I'm sorry, 21, he said, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, one that we can always come to with no problem, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from the evil conscience and our evil and evil conscience in our bodies washed with pure water. Then he says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Mm, He's trustworthy. You can depend on him. Uh, and, And let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Oh, here's that last one. Not neglecting to meet together. Not neglecting going to church as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near, as you see Christ coming. He says this, draw near. So apparently they weren't. Here's the interesting part. They weren't seeking Christ because so the first start of that remembering they were no longer doing. Remember, they were no longer being enlightened anymore. They weren't seeking Christ anymore because of what was going on around them. They put the Bible and the word down. Hmm. Then he says, hold fast. Matter of fact, let me get this. They could no longer get mercy and grace. They, you know, Hebrews 4.16 said, boldly approach the throne of grace. Was it expecting to find mercy and receive grace in your time of need? They had blew that out the water. See, some of the things we're going through is because we don't want to go to Christ, so we can't get our mercy and our grace in the midst of our storm. We draw near to Pookie and him, the TV. Uh, we draw near to uh, exercising, to dieting, to boxing and the NBA, basketball, to football, to work. We're drawing near to everything other than the, the one who is drawn near to us. And when you do that, all you've told Christ is you've lost your confidence in him. Thank you. You've lost your confidence. You think it's just, I don't feel like getting in the word that day. I don't feel like praying that day. I don't feel like doing No, no, no. He says, you've lost your confidence. Then he says, hold fast to the confession. So now you ain't seeking him no more. So guess what he says right here? You ain't talking about him no more either. Hmm. 
when people don't want to talk about Christ and you don't want to hear about the sermon, the word, the prayer, go to Bible study, join groups, serve, you don't want to do that. Well, I jumped ahead of myself. When you don't want to talk about him and what he's done for you and what he's doing, what, he, what he's going to do, lost your confidence. Lost your confidence. You got rid of it. You took it and said, man, this stuff, I can't handle this. Threw it away again. And, and then, then he says this, this final one. He says, let us consider how to stir one another up to love and good works. Now, and, and not stop going to church together. Stop meeting. Isn't that interesting? You ever hear people tell you, I don't need church to be a Christian? Right. You hear that? Yep. That craziness? Like they never read Ephesians 4. Uh, <laughs> I don't need church to be a Christian. Okay. Well, the church don't need you to be the church. But anyway, but, 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 but here's, here's the thing. The reality is that what happens is that is so backwards. Because the reality is, as Pastor talked about, I think it's in Romans 12 where it says, outdo one another with honor. We come to church not for ourselves, but to encourage one another. It's like a family at Thanksgiving when somebody don't show up. At the table. Now, if it's the one to eat too much, you're happy about that. But, 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 but it's, it's like when the one that everybody loves don't show up, there's a little bit less joy there. A little bit less joy there. You ever been to school and your best friend wasn't there? I mean, you was there, you got through it, but it wasn't as good as it was the day before because you and your best friend, y'all kind of freaking frack, you know what I'm saying? Y'all talk about what y'all talk about. Y'all go through the struggle together. See, he's saying, why don't you... Focus on stirring people up, irritating them, provoking them to love and good works. When we're not thinking about other people, not trying to encourage people, and we don't think about coming to the house of God, we take days off. When it becomes a take it or leave it thing, you've lost your confidence in him. And all it indicates is the joy is dwindling. The gladness is gone. Because you've taken your mind off the cross. And put it on your situation. You focused on the circumstance and left the cross. You focused on the situation and left the source. It's interesting how that progresses, isn't it? Draw near to him. And the result is you'll talk about him and not about your problems. And as you talk about him, you'll talk about him with people that want to talk about him. And y'all grow and be a witness to the community. A boldness, a freedom, regardless of what's going on. It's not circumstantial or situational. That verb right there is really not stir up. The verb is consider. He said, contemplate how you can make others better. He said that if you're not contemplating about making others better, it's because of the two things that didn't happen before. You stop seeking Christ, and you stop talking about the salvation and your confession about who's coming back, about that superior possession that you've received in Christ. And therefore, you don't get to the promise because you're no longer under the weight persevering. You're just under. We want to run from under the weight. He says under and remaining because we've assessed everything going on and realized that this joy of salvation, the joy of our Lord and Savior, payment on the cross for our sins, coming back, buried us in him with Christ, resurrected us in him in glory, that he's coming back, that not only he will give us a body like his, at the twinkling of an eye, he will also let us reign in the glory of the creator. What does that mean real quick? Because you say glory. What that means? That means that when you see somebody do great, and they talk about LeBron James, and this is like 10 million and a billion times greater than that. But, but just to give us you know, context, right, so we can deal with it. You know how people talk about how great LeBron James is when he comes on the court. You just know he's going to do something spectacular, right? God said that when, he comes, when Jesus comes back, you're going to go reign in the spectacular. You're going you're gonna to come in. You're going gonna to be on the team with him. In the spectacular. See, you ain't going to be looked down on. You're going to be in the spectacular. When they look around and say, who did this? Where's this all this glory, all this joy, this love, this kindness, this faithfulness? No tears, no crying, no heartache, no sickness. You're going to be reigning with him. 
Who you with? <laughs> Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we bless your name. Thank you that you are mighty, Lord. I thank you that you gave me a word to speak. You know what the situation was. Father God, in my heart, you know what the challenge was, Lord God. You know you did exactly what you always do. You send it back to you, and you show us that we are not sufficient in and of ourselves for anything to come from us. Father God, and we thank you. We thank you for this gladness that we have that is not just characterized by smiles. That's indicated and illustrated by persecution and staying up under but up under with a, a, a firm and a sound assessment based on the truth and the revelation, the illumination of the Holy Spirit that Christ is coming back, that we shall be changed and we shall reign with him, that all his enemies, which are our enemies as well, will be conquered. And then all this trivial stuff that we think is really, mag, you know, is really uh, monumental and, and significant. Father God, I mean, it's, it, we don't say it doesn't exist, but we say that it's not the only thing. It's not the main thing. And it's, they're, they're fighting to be the main thing in our hearts, Father God. And we just pray, Father God, that you'll help us to remember our earlier faithfulness. That doesn't go back to when we stood strong in the hood or when we uh, studied harder and all that stuff, that it goes back to a specific time, to a specific event, to the enlightenment as we received the, the truth of the cross and we were brought from death to life, born again in Christ, to reign for eternity with you. Father God, we thank you and pray that you would do that in every situation going on in here. Every heart that's struggling, Lord God, we pray that you would help them to rejoice in you like Paul said that the Lord is near, to not be anxious about anything, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, submit their request to God, and that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, is above everything that's going on that you really don't understand, will guard their heart and their mind in Christ Jesus. And then after they submit that, and the heart is guarded in peace, Father God, let them put their mind on the things that are praiseworthy. What you said in Philippians 4, let them put their mind on what is praiseworthy. It means that we have the ability in Christ to place our minds on the things that are praiseworthy. Because we've received your son. We didn't have that ability beforehand, Father God. But we now have your ability through the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe it starts by asking you to help us to put our mind where it belongs. Maybe it starts in worship. And prayer, Father God, help me because this is wearing me down. It's all I think about day and night. And I can't seem to get it off my mind, but Holy Spirit, help me. Help me believe out of my unbelief. Father God, meet that person right now that needs to see you mightily. In the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, touch their hearts and their mind right now. You know what's going on up under the nice sweaters, the nice jackets, the beautiful cars, the big houses, the nice jobs. You know what's going on. Father, I'm praying that you shake them up to straighten them out, to show them what the better possession is. And at the end of the day, they will give you glory and they will be stronger because of what you've taken them through, not just taking them to. It's in Jesus' name. And all the degrees said, amen.